Hi, it's Katrina. Mind control in zombies might sound like something that happens only in movies, but from caterpillars to spiders to even us, here are 10 scary examples of zombies in nature. Number 10. Glyptopantales wasp The Glyptopantales is a genus of wasp that turn caterpillars into zombies. They are found in Central and North America and New Zealand. The female wasps inject their eggs into caterpillars which are alive and well, minding their own business. From there, the eggs hatch and the larvae start to grow. As they are growing, they slowly start taking over the caterpillar, feeding on its fluids and taking over its mind to turn it into a bodyguard that protects them. The caterpillar slowly starves to death as the larvae continue to grow. When they are ready, the larvae mature and gnaw their way out of its skin all at the same time. Then the caterpillar finally dies and the wasps go on to find a new caterpillar to use as the host for their eggs. Scientists have brought this life cycle into their labs for study, probably for the creepiness factor. Poor caterpillars. Through this research, we have learned that these wasps can greatly boost their chances of survival compared to other wasps. No kidding. Not that we were really worried about the wasp population because it seems like they are doing just fine. Number 9. The Forehead Fly the forehead fly is a South American fruit fly species that has been experimentally used for getting invasive ant populations under control. These mind-controlling flies turn ants into zombies and kill invasive fire ant species. In 2018, the Daily Texan reported that the red imported fire ant causes roughly $1.2 billion of economic damage and infests 80 million acres of land in Texas annually. Research scientist Dr. Rob Plows of the Department of Integrative Biology said they are very concerned about the ant's impact on native species and their potential to disrupt food webs. Apparently, very few native ants are left. But traditional chemicals and devices do not work against these tough fire ants. So the next best solution? Turn them into zombies! To hopefully develop an effective method for reducing the losses caused by the ants, scientists brought forehead flies, a type of fruit fly that is a natural parasite to red imported fire ants, up from South America and bred them in an ant chamber, which plows refer to as a zombie breeding zone. See, I knew you thought science was boring. The forehead flies use their injection stingers to implant eggs into the ant's shoulder joints. A maggot hatches and makes its way into its host's brain, where it feeds on the ant's head tissues, mainly its jaw muscles. As a result, the ant develops zombie-like dangling jaws. Within weeks, the parasitic maggot gains control over the ant's behavior from within. The zombified ant then leaves the nest for a safe, quiet place where the maggot releases an enzyme that causes its head to fall off. It remains in the decapitated ant's head for the next two weeks before exiting its mouth as a fly. Plows admitted that this form of pest control is not a cure-all to the overwhelming red imported fire ant population, but that breeding forward flies can noticeably reduce their ability to damage their surroundings and slow colony growth. What a way to go, right? Number 8. Parasitoid Wasp Hymenopimesis argyrophaga is a Costa Rican wasp species whose female specimens lay their eggs on the abdomens of orb spiders. They do this by stinging the spider, which has a temporary paralyzing effect, and glue an egg to its belly. The wasp larva spends a few weeks living on its host, drilling holes into the spider and feasting on its blood. During that time, life continues normally for the spider, who goes about their daily activities none the wiser about the uninvited guest living on their body. Then, the wasp larva injects the spider with a chemical that makes it spin a very strange web that looks like nothing typical of the species. Once the spider finishes building the web, it simply sits in the middle of it. The web, which is made of very strong lines, doesn't even break in the rain. This web does not serve the spider's typical interest of catching prey. Instead, it is designed to hold the wasp larva's cocoon, which the larva builds after molting. Then it kills and eats the spider. It injects it with a poison, sucks its body dry, and discards it. I told you, nature is hardcore stuff. Researchers notice that even if the larva somehow leaves the spider without completing the process, the damage is done, as the spider will still build a web meant for holding the larva's cocoon and doesn't survive long after that. Wasps have no feelings at all! 
And now for number seven. But first, big shout out to Jessica Klitsky and her son. Thanks so much, Jessica, and I'm glad you guys like the creepy videos. Remember to subscribe if you are new here and join us if you haven't already. Number seven, Yuha Plorcus californiensis. This critter is a brain-infesting parasite that lives primarily in salt marshes and estuaries along the California coast, hence its name. But don't worry, it's not after our brains. It begins its life in the horn snail before entering the water and searching for its next host, the killifish, a populous species that commonly carries the parasite. The invader lives as a cyst on the killifish's brain during its next stage of life, causing the host to swim in unnatural ways, like near the water's surface, in circles, and otherwise erratically. While an infested killifish can still swim with as much strength and speed as an uninfested specimen and can still reproduce and get enough food, its bizarre behavior is harmful because it draws attention to predators. One experiment conducted by researcher Kevin Lafferty showed that infected killifish are between 10 and 30 times more likely to get captured and eaten. To reproduce, Euaplorchus californiensis must relocate to its third host, the shorebird, which notices the killifish swimming around like a maniac, catches it, eats it, and voila! The parasite is inside the bird's guts. It lays eggs, which are deposited through the shorebird's feces and ingested by the horned snail, starting the parasite's life cycle all over again. Researchers are unsure exactly how parasites have become so good at controlling their host behavior. Some believe that they may release chemicals that affect the animal's nervous system or neurochemistry. Others think that simply being infested with parasites is enough to stress an animal out and alter their behavior. In any case, once the parasite has a hold on them, they are pretty much done for. Number 6. Hair Worms Also known as a horsehair worm or Gordian worm, a hair worm is a land-dwelling, hair-like parasite, hence its name, that needs an aquatic habitat to reproduce. It achieves this during its younger days by first finding its way into a cricket, beetle, grasshopper, or a similar insect where it grows into adulthood and ultimately takes over the bug's brain. Though scientists are still figuring out exactly how the relationship works, it's clear that the infestation involves the hairworm releasing chemicals that cause the host to migrate toward water and, well, jump in, essentially drowning itself. There are around 350 identified hairworm species throughout the world, and they have different preferred hosts and varied life cycles, but they all start out as a string of eggs in a stream, river, or other water body. Once they're born, the larvae are eaten by other insect larvae like mayflies, which is exactly what they want, and burrow into the host's flesh. Developing hairworms cannot grow inside of these middlemen of sorts, who are just there to transport them to their next destination, a cricket, for example. They curl up, grow a shell, and wait to reach this third host by remaining inside the mayfly or a similar insect until it is eaten by something else. Once they enter the cricket's body, a hairworm larva uncurls and feeds on its fat stores, causing it to stop growing and reproducing, with male crickets even losing their ability to chirp. This prevents them from finding or even looking for a mate and minimizes the amount of energy the cricket needs, also protecting him from predators. The hairworm basically harms its host while keeping them alive at the same time. Eventually, the hairworm reaches adulthood, measuring between 1 and 2 feet long, and by then it has more or less fully taken over the cricket's brain, causing it to wander aimlessly until it ends up in the water, which crickets usually avoid. Once submerged, the hairworms exit the cricket, mate, and lay eggs right away. Whether the cricket drowns or not, it dies once the hairworm leaves its body. Number 5. Acacia Trees and Ants some plants and ants have what is known as a symbiotic relationship, which is essentially a mutually beneficial situation between two species. In other words, it's a win-win for both parties. For the ants, the trees provide nectar, which the ants eat, and hollow thorns, which they use as nests. Meanwhile, the ants guard the trees against harmful herbivores, competing plants, and damaging leaf pathogens, contributing greatly to the tree's health. If another creature tries eating from the tree, the ants sting or attack it, even if it is much larger than them. A 2014 study by researchers from the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology revealed that the bacterial presence on the acacia leaves is greatly reduced by the ants. So why do the ants love this tree so much in particular? There is a reason why ants are so loyal to the acacia tree, and it boils down to a mind control chemical in the tree's nectar, which causes the ants to go into a defensive frenzy and guard the tree. 
Researchers are still learning about the complex relationship between ants and acacia trees, which they now believe may not be as much of a two-way street as they once thought. The more we learn, the more it seems as if the tree infiltrates the ant colony with a chemical that causes them to do its bidding. Simply put, the ants may be more necessary for the acacia tree's survival than the other way around. Number 4. Toxoplasma gondii Do you have a cat? Do you really, really love your cat? If you're not careful, you might have toxoplasmosis. If you ever see rats that aren't afraid of cats, there is a good chance that they are infected with a single-celled parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. It can infest many, if not most, warm-blooded creatures, including people, causing a disease called toxoplasmosis. This parasite particularly favors rodents, however, because it needs to make its way into a cat's intestines in order to reproduce. In the case of rats, the parasite infiltrates the animal's brain and eliminates their natural fear of cats. In fact, they are often even attracted to them. Without this fear factor in the brain, the rodent is more likely to be devoured by a feline, thus enabling Toxoplasma gondii to enter the cat and breed. Toxoplasmosis is relatively common among humans, infecting around 200,000 people annually. Luckily, the parasite does not have the same mind control effect on us that it does on rodents, but it typically causes flu-like effects. Sometimes infected humans experience no symptoms at all. That's right, you might have toxoplasmosis and not even know it, although the disease shouldn't go untreated when it comes to unborn or newborn babies and people with compromised immune systems. It is also known as the cat litter parasite, and we are most likely to catch it from eating undercooked infected meat or while cleaning the kitty litter. Mental issues such as schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety are more common in people with toxoplasmosis. Number 3. Zombie Roaches Not many members of the animal kingdom successfully prey on cockroaches. Most species do not benefit from them at all, and us humans prefer to be as far away from them as possible. It's hard to picture these pests serving any purpose, but the jewel wasp has managed to make use of these seemingly pointless creatures. Females use cockroaches as hosts for their eggs. Step one of this process involves injecting a paralyzing toxin into the roach, which immobilizes its front legs. Then the lady jewel wasp repeats this step, this time targeting the roach's head. The chemical mixture she uses alters the cockroach's brain function and metabolism, basically turning it into a zombie. When the vile insect is rendered even more useless than it is as a fully functioning creature and can no longer move on its own, the jewel wasp grabs it by the antenna and relocates it to her burrow. Then she lays her egg on top of the roach. Her larva feeds slowly on the roach over the course of several days, pupates in its abdomen, and then emerges about a month later as an adult. Number 2. Flatworms There are various types of parasitic flatworms. One of the nastiest among them is Leucochloridium paradoxum, known more commonly as the green-banded brood sac. They need a full cycle of birds and snails to reproduce. Its eggs are excreted in bird feces in larval form, which are then eaten by snails. Once inside this new host, the larvae begin growing, eventually taking over the snail's tentacles. In what's known in the scientific world as mimicry, one or both appendages grow to resemble maggots or wriggling worms. Snails with L. paradoxum spend more time in open, better-lit areas, as well as higher vegetation, making them easy targets for birds. Once gobbled up by a bird, the parasites grow into adults and reproduce. Their eggs are released in the bird droppings and the process repeats. The lancet liver fluke is another parasitic flatworm that uses mind control. It dwells in the livers of cows and other herbivorous grazing animals who excrete its eggs along with their feces. Snails then eat the dung and the eggs hatch inside of them. Then the snail coughs up the parasites in the form of mucus balls. Then ants come along and eat the slime. One of the parasites hijacks the ant's brain, while the rest remain inside its abdomen waiting patiently. As a result, the ant's mind is taken over as the invader leads it to sit atop blades of grass and other vegetation every night until a sheep or other animal eats it. And it's back to step one of the lancet liver flukes life cycle. Number 1. Rabies most mind control is caused by parasites that cause little damage to humans. However, rabies is different. Rabies is a deadly virus that causes an array of terrifying symptoms in nearly everything it infects, which is why we're so cautious about making sure our pet shots are up to date and that we avoid contact with wild animals, especially nocturnal creatures that are seen being active during the day. 
like raccoons. Don't feed the raccoons. In cases of human infestation, our immune systems often do not even detect the small bullet-shaped rabies virus. It's extremely easy to catch. Even just a scratch can cause someone to contract rabies, which again is why we steer clear of wild and stray animals, especially those behaving strangely. Rabies takes over its host's bloodstream, then hijacks their cells and turns them into virus factories, helping the disease multiply by thousands at a time. Eventually, the virus reaches the host's nervous system and brain, targeting the hippocampus, amygdala, and hypothalamus, structures that play important roles in memory, emotion, and fear. Instead of simply devouring cells, rabies causes them to release certain neurotransmitters, essentially turning them against the host. Rabies causes animals to become violent toward other living beings, even those they were familiar with before becoming ill. In humans, the virus causes an irrational fear of puffs of air and water, which cause the patient to twitch and flinch involuntarily. They also have difficulty swallowing. The symptoms worsen from there, causing people to hallucinate and become confused and violent. Insomnia, heavy perspiration, delirium, and stupor set in next. Then the heart and lungs are affected and the patient falls into a coma. This disease is fatal. There are less than 10 documented cases of people surviving clinical stage rabies infections, and an estimated 60,000 people die annually from it. Thankfully, there is a vaccine, which is recommended for people who are likely to encounter wild animals. Thanks for watching. Hope that you can sleep tonight. Which one did you think was the creepiest? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you later. Bye.